This episode is brought to you by Bumble. Bumble believes your mental well-being should be a top priority. It's why they're committed to providing in-app tools to support mental health while dating, like their Safety and Wellbeing Center, which has helpful resources to combat dating fatigue and anxiety. And with Snooze Mode, you can take a pause from dating while you focus on yourself. Bumble even released a new suite of self-care badges and prompts for your profile. It's a simple way to show your commitment to self-care. Take care of you, then download Bumble today. On this episode of Narcissist Apocalypse, we talk with an abuse survivor named Lauren, and Lauren was married to a criticizing serial cheater. It's a story of isolation, double lives, bullying, and betrayal trauma. Welcome to Narcissist Apocalypse, everyone. I am Brandon Chadwick, and with me today, we have Lauren. How are you? I'm fine, thanks, Brandon. Well, thank you for being here. And if you want to be a guest on our show like Lauren is today, please do go to our website at NarcissistApocalypse.com. Top of the page, there's a button that says Guest Form. When you click on that button, it takes you to our Guest Form page. There you can read all of our instructions and either send us an email at NarcissistApocalypse at gmail.com or fill out our Guest Form and press the Submit button. And please do send it in the format that we ask for. And today you're going to hear Lauren's story. And with Lauren's story, it takes a long time for the abuse to unfold because of what is going on behind the scenes with her abuser. Her abuser didn't want things to be known. So it took a very long time for these things to actually uh, show themselves. And when they do, things really start to fall apart. So a really big thank you to Lauren for being here with us today. There is no content warning for our episode today. So now I'm just going to get out of my way, in your way. Lauren, the floor is now yours. So basically what I want to say is that this, my story is more or less about the hidden emotional abuse that you can experience in intimate relationships. I had no clue throughout the relationship that I was actually in a toxic relationship or a destructive relationship. Uh, Until after the relationship ended, I quickly realized that the man that I had met at the start was nowhere to be seen. It's a complete different man. And I actually refer to this as throughout the relationship is like, what happened? It was like, he loves me. He loves me not. Because it was the devaluation through that stage, you get conflicting information and it just basically confuses you. Uh, You lose your sense of identity, you lose your sense of self. So that is basically what happened through my relationship. So before we get to your relationship, tell us about your childhood and how you were raised. Well, I come from the northeast of England. That's my accent in the UK. And the relationship, where the family relationship was basically came from um, a background where my parents divorced and there was some physical violence in in my parents' relationship. As I was very young, I used to hear arguments uh, and actually saw bruises on both of both of my parents, my mother and my father. But my father basically was drinking a lot and my mother had a couple of um, affairs, basically. So when it come to the relationship end, um, I was still at school. My brothers were younger than me and they were still at school. And um, the relationship between my mother and father ended and I ended up becoming more or less the housekeeper. 
Well, when I was at school, I didn't really have a lot of aspirations. I was basically wanting to get out of school. I didn't want to go to college, didn't have any aspirations whatsoever. In fact, I remember telling my father that I was never going to get married. And I remember what happened is when I'd left school, I um, I ended up drifting into a couple of friendships. Uh, I ended up going out drinking on an evening to get out of the house situation. And um, so that would turn into where I would drink a beer with a friend and that would be every night. So I actually started down the same route and that my father was already in with drinking alcohol. Uh, and obviously five days a week, six days a week, whatever, how many times I went out every, nearly every night and started drinking alcohol, which wasn't good as a teenager. And then I got into all sorts of other things like um, smoking and things like that, as you do sometimes. Um, but I think it was just part of like fitting in basically with the crowd of people that I was with at the time. So you eventually get into different relationships and we're going to run through them, which leads into the story of the person uh, that this story is about. So um, I guess take us through uh, these relationships and what's kind of going on in them, how they differ and what's happening with you uh, throughout them. Right. Okay. So um. It in when I meet my first husband, and within that relationship, um, after a number of years, I felt that I was like a, a a single parent or a lone parent in that relationship because I didn't feel as he was emotionally supportive towards me. I felt that if any that any time that I was trying to um, suggest things because. I found out in that relationship that I was a bit of, I was entrepreneurial. I didn't realize that I was entrepreneurial and I used to do all sorts of things like I had a knitting machine, bought this knitting machine and I started knitting clothes, uh, you know, and I would bake cakes at Christmas time and I would sell, people would say, can you, you do this or decorate this cake? And so I would do all of these things like entrepreneurial things while I was married. Um, but when I suggested something that might help us in later years, which I wanted to um, invest in property was the thing that I was looking at. And we're talking in the 80s where there wasn't a lot of people like me and him that were investing in property, but it was definitely a big no for him. Uh, so that marriage actually ended in divorce. At the time that we were basically drifting apart, he was a student and studying and I had started Open University, so I was studying for a degree as well. And at that point in time, I ended up with three part-time jobs. And so when I decided that the relationship was coming to an end, it was quite easy for me to actually leave the situation I wasn't trapped. I had some independent income. And so that ended in what I call one of the three days of the relationship endings, which was divorce. There's a school in Northern Virginia that's making college better. They offer over 100 certificate and degree programs. They make tuition affordable and manageable through smaller payments over time. They make online learning accessible and enjoyable. And across six campuses, you can learn great careers like nursing, cybersecurity, skilled trades, and more. Northern Virginia Community College. It's the affordable, achievable, flexible, doable, possible, incredible college. Nova. We make college better. Apply now at boldlynova.com. This episode is brought to you by Bumble. Bumble believes your mental well-being should be a top priority. It's why they're committed to providing in-app tools to support mental health while dating, like their Safety and Wellbeing Center, which has helpful resources to combat dating fatigue and anxiety. And with Snooze Mode, you can take a pause from dating while you focus on yourself. Bumble even released a new suite of self-care badges and prompts for your profile. It's a simple way to show your commitment to self-care. Take care of you, then download Bumble today. So then you become a single mom with two children and being a single mom is very difficult and then you get into a relationship with someone new. So tell us how all of this worked. 
I'm living now living um, separately and uh, in the rented house, studying for my degree, working three part-time jobs. And I've um, met this new person and uh, everything seems okay. He was he had his house and I had my house and we just start this like relationship, nothing sort of serious. That relationship continued for around t- 10 years um, and we had massive ups and downs because now looking back, I can see that um, he had like a jealous streak and there was all sorts of other things that were going on. He gets stressed about finances uh, and I was always loaning him money <laughs> uh, and getting into trouble with that way. Um, but at the same time, that relationship lasted until um, he actually died of a heart attack um, in 2006. But the year before, in 2005, we started a business together. It was property management and it was student rentals. The business went from two landlords and five houses, doubled that business in three months, doubled again in the next three months with no knowledge of anything to do with property management. And me, all I did was write down on a piece of paper, that's what I wanted to do. Unfortunately, my partner died 18 months after setting that business up in uh, December of uh, 2006. So that was the second ending of a day of a relationship, death of a partner. So after you go through the grieving process, you eventually meet the person that this story is about online on an app, and he fits all of your criteria, which is a caring businessman who likes to go on trips, and you talk to him for a while, and then you eventually meet him in person. So walk us through this first meeting. Before we meet... For our lunch date, uh, he explains that before you go and meet anyone new, you should actually let someone know that you're going to meet, you know. So he's telling me, um, tell your friend or someone that you're going to you're going out on a lunch date and then when you meet me on this lunch date, you let them know that you're, you're safe and that you've met the person. It's like, right, okay. And then he's telling me, um, to do some research on him because he's a businessman and he's got a website and he runs, he's been running his business for a while. And so I put his name into Google to actually search and do the research that he said I should look up. And uh, I'm not a person who just looks at the first thing that appears and, de- and delve a little deeper and delve a little deeper and that's what happened. I basically found a lot more information that I wasn't expecting to find because I then realized that on the Dayton website that he had a wife that was on that website and they were still married. And I was like, oh, do I want to meet this person? He's never said anything about being married. So that was the first thing. And then when we actually physically met, for lunch, he then was um, honest. I thought, okay, because he actually said he was married. He told me he was married. He said he'd spent his birthday alone because his birthday was February. Mine was March. I'd just had my birthday. He'd spent his birthday alone. Uh, And he'd been in this relationship for about three years, but they'd only got married in the year before. But by the December... She'd left. I did see it as red flag, basically. <laughs> I never thought that, oh, why did she only have been married six months? So here is this person who has a lot of skeletons in their closet, but they've opened up the closet for you to see the skeletons in a way where it's like, I'm showing you all of this. You can trust me. You know, there's no fear of letting you see all of these things. And so whatever red flags that might be there for you, you're just looking at the honesty part. So this person has gotten their foot in the door with you 
And for a lot of people like this, all they need is that foot in the door to then throw that door wide open. So you mentioned to me that there was this really one big day that uh, impressed you about their caring nature. So tell us about this story. Yeah, um, this was a day out that we had. and um, We'd gone to a, a city centre. Um, we spent a lot of time walking around. We went one place, then another place. I was, It was showing me the different spikes and the corn exchange and, and different places. And so when we stopped, we went to a bar for a beer and I was preoccupied because I, my foot had got this blister from walking around a lot. And he noticed that I was preoccupied with, with under the table in my shoe and he asked me what was wrong. When I told him I had a blister, first thing he said was, right, when we've drank this beer, we should go to a chemist shop and buy some sticking plasters. And I thought, oh, that's never happened before. And and just so everyone knows who's American uh, or Canadian, a chemist is a pharmacy and a, and a plaster is a Band-Aid. So then we end up going to the uh, shop uh, and we're in the chemist. And this, the first thing he does is find the chair, sit me down, and he goes off hunting to find these stick and plasters. And he comes back with the box. He sits down in front of me, takes my shoe off, takes the plasters out and puts it over where the blister is. And I am sitting there going, oh, wow, this has never happened before. Um, then he goes off and pays for, for this box of plasters. And I'm thinking, I'm thinking to myself, look, the other two relationships, none of them would have done this. And... I would have likely been called some stupid name because they would have been saying, well, why were you wearing those shoes? Or, you know, there'd be something, there'd be a reason why the blister on my foot would have been <laughs> caused by me, basically. And it wouldn't, they wouldn't have shown any care inside. So I was basically blown away by that. I was thinking, this, is, I've never had this happen before. And was there a moment for you in the beginning parts of this relationship where you were hooked, like this This is the person for me? Yes, because what happened was there was like a time where um, we went for a walk on a, an airfield near to where he lives. And as we were walking on this airfield, he starts talking about how he's been hurt by different relationships of his past. And he was asking me, I don't want to be hurt. Can you let me know if, you know, if you if you want a, a commitment because I don't want to go into a relationship again uh, and be hurt. It's if you if you don't want to be in a relationship, I want to know now. And so I was saying, oh, right, okay. So he was wanting me to say whether or not I felt the same way as he did because obviously he didn't want to be hurt. And at that point in time, I was like, yes, I'd had been keep holding back my emotions. I didn't want to uh, do anything too quickly to get into a, a a relationship like that. But when he came out with that, I was, I could, I could see that yes, I can commit to this relationship. So that's the the first point that we actually talked about that. So you end up being in this relationship with this person for a very long time. But with your relationship, which differs from a lot of people's relationships when they're in one with an abuser, the abuse with someone who, as we're going to find out, is someone who is um, a serial cheater, someone who's going to be leading a double life. For a long period of time, you have no idea, you know, you think you're in a fantastic relationship. There are no red flags. And if there is one red flag, you know, you caught him or he was he was texting with his ex-wife. So when you're in this process and 
so so when you're in this relationship and he's texting with his ex-wife how are you feeling about these things and how is he passing these things off right so there was a lot of different times that he would say oh uh I've just got another text message. I've just got another email message. And this was dropping in at different times throughout the the relationship. Uh, continued for a number of months in, in the first year, all of this was happening. And uh, I always keep on thinking, why doesn't he just block the emails and the texts? But I told him, why don't you just block? You don't need to see them. Um, but he continued. And then there was a point where he told me that he was going to ask his ex-wife to help him to do work. And I was working my own business in Sunderland. He was working his own business. And uh, one day, I sitting in, in the car and I decided to give him a call. And I ring the wrong number. I rang the landline instead of his mobile. And the landline was picked up. And the person that answers wasn't him. It was his ex-wife who was at his house. And that was such a shock that I hung the phone up and I just burst into tears while I was sitting in the car. I couldn't understand that, yes, he told us that he was going to ask his wife to do work. But in my mind, I thought, okay, um, she's going to be in his in her house doing work for him. Uh, I wasn't expecting that she would be in his house. And so that came as a shock. Basically, he um, called me back. I was upset. Uh, and, and I just thought, all right, well, I accepted it. But from that point forward, I always looked at his ex-wife as being a threat to the relationship. So you initially met in 2009 and for a very long period of time, besides the stuff with his ex-wife, everything is normal and you are vacationers. You like to go on vacations to different places and one place that you both enjoyed was Spain. And, And then at a certain point, I think you said it was in 2015-ish. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. 2015, you you both decide that you want a vacation home and you go to Spain to start looking at properties. And, you know, when it comes to uh, this aspect of everything, this is when things really do start to change so you wind up you know picking a specific property and it's a property that needs work so this is the beginning of isolation and it's isolation not fully in the sense of how everyone thinks about isolation in the you know we think of isolation in the sense of they're keeping me away from other people people because they don't know what they don't want uh, they don't want everyone to know what type of abuse is going on inside the home but for him you know you being there is a little bit different because for him it's more of I can go out and do these other things that I want to so you get there uh and how you know I guess there's a couple processes here one how does this isolation start? What are the reasons behind it? And you are an independent businesswoman who has her own business. And moving there starts to give a little bit of issues on that as far as you know, being a property manager on properties that are far away from you. So tell us about, I guess, the unwinding of the independence and then the beginning, I guess, of how this isolation starts. Right. So basically what happens is um, once um, we realize the house can't be left on its own and we want to have a pool built, 
So in 2016, I'm here um, to, to oversee the construction work of the pool. And um, the I think what happened was in April, he lost his mother and we used to shop for her every weekend uh, when I was there in York. And while I was here in Spain, he made the decision that I wasn't going to go with him for the funeral. I was going to stay here with construction work that was going on. I was really upset by that, um, not being able to go back to the UK and be with him and support him and then be with all the people at that point. So that made us feel really upset about that. When he makes a statement like that, that, you know, you really want to go there and be part of this and be part of the funeral, you know, this this is this person's mom and you want to be part of that this person's life and be there for them. When that decision is made by him and you're not getting a decision part of this process, how are you rationalizing that? What is your thought process around you know, something that is pretty big, even, you know, it's, you're, you want to be there and you want to be part of that aspect of their life, but you're being told no. So there's this, you know, chain of command that's going on. Is this a chain of command that had gone on constantly, but you didn't notice? There was incidents over the time that we were together, which I just brushed to one side. I didn't realize how much that he would shut down my decisions, shut down things that I wanted to do. Yeah, that I didn't I didn't understand what was happening in the dynamic of the relationship. And so this this particular thing that happened, I just thought, all right, okay, it's because the construction work's going on and he wants me to be here. So that's how I explained that one to myself. So, you know, you're there for a little bit of time him going back to the funeral happens and you are, you know, alone a lot while you are tending to everything that's going on in Spain. And this is when you really do, you know, first start to notice demeanor changes that are noticeable. So uh, walk us through this. The first episode I can um, put my finger on was when we first got the property. Um, he ha- he'd been drinking quite a lot, and this night we were sitting in the house, and all of a sudden he came out with a statement: "Was I've made a huge mistake? I- I've made a huge mistake. I shouldn't have bought this house." I couldn't understand why he was saying that, but basically I sat on the sofa and I was was basically in tears. I couldn't understand why he said that. Um, Then the next day, the sun's shining. I'm out in the garden. There's olive trees, there's citrus trees, grapefruits, lemons, oranges. And I go down to the garden and there's lots of grapefruits. I pick uh, loads of grapefruits, come right back towards the house with this big dish with the grapefruits in. And once I get inside of the kitchen, he then says, how lovely it is to see you coming across the garden with all these fresh grapefruits. So one time he's saying, I've made a huge mistake. Oh my, you know. And then the next day it's like, how lovely it is to see you coming across the garden with all this. You've got two different things happening at the same time. Uh, and that just basically confuses confuses you. The second time something happened was in mid-2016 when we had guests here. The guests had been a couple of days. So this day he has uh, basically just helped himself to some drink and cheese and biscuits and things, sat on the table alone. And it, the atmosphere in the house was like, you could just cut the atmosphere with a knife because it was just not, there wasn't any conversation, anything going on. And the two guests are sitting on the sofa and I'm sitting on the other sofa. And at this point in time, I'm building an online business with Amazon. 
and I had an, an Amazon store and uh, I'd made some sales. So I thought, okay, I can go and I can show him how I've made these sales and try to bring, bring him back into the conversation. Uh, so I go over, over to where he's sit, sitting then and I've made some sales in my business and there was just two sentences that came back and it was, this is important because and this is good because and I just like froze. I thought, what? And that was the first time that I actually opened my iPad and started writing Dear Diary and started writing like notes in my iPad on the different things that had happened. And I wrote, it's like emotional abuse and bully behavior, the way you talk to me. And the other thing I wrote was, I don't want to be treated like a child. I don't want to be talked to like a child. So he started with this negative frame of mind, and you're also sometimes getting a positive frame of mind from him, kind of like a hot and cold. And here's a story of him humiliating you in front of other people. And we're getting a sense that he really likes to be right. And there's criticism going on and there's condescending uh, talk going on as well. Does criticism of you ramp up during this time? Quite a lot. Um, I just felt that I couldn't do anything right. Um, you know, if I was to do things in the garden or, you know, even to go shopping to buy different things, it's like there was I was never seeming to be right. Um, for example, it was like we were going to um, a lunch out with a neighbour and I'm driving the car's normal. So we go out and all of a sudden he's saying to me, uh, you've gone the wrong way. And I'm driving the car and I'm thinking, oh, right, okay. Uh, he doesn't want us to go this way. So he would always say so something negative like that. So this day I was in the car and I said to him, while the neighbour was in the back of the car, I said, which way would you want us to go? Because he was always telling us, you've gone this way, you shouldn't have done that, you shouldn't have done this. So I'm asking him the question, which way do you want us to go? And he snapped back and said, and, and, and basically then embarrassed me again in front of the neighbour. Sometimes he would come out with a swear word, a curse word, something like you're driving the car, you, you know, at, and I'm thinking, you can't win. You couldn't win because if you asked him the question, which way do you want him to go, he snapped at you. And if you just went on the, whichever way you thought was the best way to go, he still snapped at you so you couldn't really win. So this behavior really starts to take hold for, you know, all of 2016 and... This is a person now who is completely different from the person before you moved to Spain or before you got the vacation home. You didn't realize you were going to be really living there full time most of the time and be isolated. So yeah. this behavior is continuing and he's going back and forth mm -hmm. and you're mainly there. So eventually we get to uh, November 2017, where now you're kind of really knee deep in all of this and, you know, the distance is becoming an issue. So walk us uh, through this. Yes. In mid-2017, I was still looking at pursuing a way of having an independent income and I had invested in the online education business, and I was learning new skills. And um, things were sort of going okay, learning these new skills, and I was excited again, thinking, yeah, okay. I was meeting new people, and uh, I, was because I was happy in what I was trying to do, uh, going out and doing exercise classes and learning Spanish and things like that. So I was quite happy to do that. He would come over at certain times and spend time with me. So we would have like 
four to six weeks in the UK, four to six weeks in Spain, and it was backwards and forwards because he had business, he was working. Um, but then in November, for some reason, it was like my intuition was saying something, I don't know what, I, I felt really, really sad. And I didn't know why I felt sad. I got up this morning this morning, and I looked out the window. It was a lovely sunny day. And I could see all the broken beer across on the hedge and everything. But then I just burst into tears. I didn't know why I was crying. It was like really weird. I had this sensation. And I remember after I'd stopped crying, I had a cup of tea and I thought, right, I'm going to ring him. I can't stay here by myself anymore. I don't want to be alone anymore. So I rang him and I'm explaining this. I'm, I'm like, I've, I've been crying. I don't know why, why I'm crying. And um, he sort of calms me down and he's telling me, look, um, I'll be there. It'll just be another few weeks. Um, I'll be there for you. We'll be together at, at Christmas. Christmas time arrives and he comes out. We have our Christmas dear. And then he said, I've got something to tell you. Uh, and I was listening and he, he, he said, can you remember when... Um, I used to talk about my wedding day girl and I just basically thought, oh, he's going to tell a joke. And then he, he basically then explained about that he'd met this woman four weeks before, which would have been November. He'd met this woman in November and he'd started having an affair with this woman. He'd met up with her again. He would knew her from 2009. But he's, he's, he's met up with her again in November. And when that sunk in, I basically just stood up in the middle of the lounge and I just screamed out loud for a long time. And I just walked away into the bedroom. Uh, and that basically what he'd just done then caused a maximum damage and maximum hurt because after that, I was basically in grief, in shock. Um, there was trauma and there was anxiety and I wasn't sleeping at all. And what did he say about this relationship? Was it some, Did he say to you, um, I don't want to be with this other person? Or is he saying, like, what's his, how's he referring to everything? Well, basically... He was then telling me he was entitled to see this woman because he works very hard. And so when he was in the UK, he would be with this woman. And when he was here with me, he would be with me. He wouldn't be communicating with her when he was with me. And he wouldn't be communicating with me when he was with her. And that was how I was told that is what he was going to do. So he was like basically creating a, an open relationship at that point when in my mind there was no open relationship. In my mind, I was in a committed relationship where there was just the two of us and that's how I was thinking of it. In my mind, he was having a midlife crisis and he was having an affair, basically a midlife crisis and an affair. So after you find out this information about the Wednesday girl, which is very difficult to process after this many years of the relationship, he then starts to deposit almost 700 pounds a month into your bank account when you don't need it at all. There's an other account that is paying a lot of the bills for the house that you're in and he's now throwing the $700 a month at you in specifically into your bank account. And this is a strategy that is being used here to hold it over your head when he needs to play that card as if you're taking stuff from him, even though you never even asked for this. He's really making this situation up. He's creating this situation. So one day, which he eventually does do, you know, he starts to play this card. So if you do start to challenge him, he has the ability now to, you know, say that I'm putting money in here and you're ungrateful and you didn't even ask for these things and you didn't even need these things. So this is what started to happen. And as I stated before, 
you know, the person that you once knew does not exist anymore. And now you are openly being cheated on. And you're really being told that this is the way it is. Money is being held over your head. You're being bullied. You know, the betrayal alone is, you know, very traumatizing. You're, it's very confusing. Yep. So, you know, what is your thought process beyond that confusion in that trauma? Are you able to have a thought process after that? And how are you coping and figuring out or maneuvering your way through this relationship? Because he stated his point. He ain't changing. This is what he is doing. You have no say in this. So, and now you are far away from everyone. You're isolated. So how are you trying to figure your way through this part of uh, the relationship? It's very difficult. Um, Obviously, getting through all of this, like, say, the anxiety, the trauma and everything. But there comes a point where one morning I I woke up and this voice was saying to me, you're killing yourself slowly. Because what I had started to do was to go out a lot. So I'm starting to repeat a pattern that I'd had before. Um, So I would go out um, and socialise. And every time I went out to socialise, that meant I was in the bar, I was going to drink, I would have a beer, I'd have wine. So on Mondays I would go out because that was quiz night. Tuesdays I would go out because that was learning Spanish. Wednesdays I would go out because that was darts. Thursdays I was Spanish again. And Friday night was the night that we could socialise with like different neighbours in the bar. So I was out five nights a week drinking wine and beer. So I was starting down a slippery slope, as a lot of women do, as a lot of men do as well, when they're in these trauma, anxiety states. And the other thing that you can do is use in grief and anxiety is you use food as well. So if it's not alcohol, it's food. So you can either stop eating a lot of food and lose a lot of weight or start eating more food and gain a lot of weight. And so your health is suffering. And that's why I woke up this day and I thought, you're killing yourself slowly. And that's when I wanted to change. So this change started to happen and you started to enjoy your life again, even though that you were in this relationship and that it's not great bad things are going on, but you're choosing yourself partly in a lot. You're still in the relationship, but you're choosing, you know, to um, be there for yourself a little bit more. Mm-hmm. So at this point, um, you know, two th- this, we're far into 2019, 2020 happens, and out of nowhere you get discarded. So walk us through this. So um, 2019, I've regained quite a lot of my confidence and uh, I've started to meet other people. I'm going to art classes. I'm doing yoga and I'm feeling quite confident in myself again. And he's ended this affair and I'm thinking everything's back on track, relationships back on track. He's making a commitment at last. He's got um, transport some stuff from the house in York. And he's, you know, we're going to be together at last. This is the way I'm thinking. And then we get the COVID and the lockdown. And then we are together. He doesn't want to leave. He wants to stay here. He doesn't want to be alone in, in the UK. He doesn't want to leave me alone. And so we have... um about six months together uh, in in our Spanish home. Um, he leaves 
uh, the first flight he could leave was in July, uh, mid-July. And so he leaves to go back to the UK. In August, he flew back on the 25th. He had a lot of things to talk about. The first thing that he says is, I've got something to tell you. And like my mind flashed back to 2017, to December 2017 with, I've got something to tell you. And I was like, oh, so I'm in a reaction mode by then, just by that one sentence. The second sentence he said was, I'm in love with another woman. The next one was, we can remain friends if you want to remain friends. And then I sat there, and I was like, totally in shock because the woman that he was now telling me that he was in love with was a woman that he'd lived with briefly back in the 1980s, 38 years in his past, who he had discarded back then because that woman had cheated on him. And now, 38 years later, he's telling me he's in love with this woman and he'd only just met her on the 21st of August after a 38 years part. I was blown away. So on the 29th of August, he is in the office and he's writing out a financial proposal. So the property goes up for sale. The first viewing is within days. This is all happening very, very, very quickly. Yeah. So what happens with this part of the story? Right. Okay. So I'm basically cooperating with the sale of the property. I arranged the agent and um, within a couple of days, there's a viewing and the viewing happens. And then on the 4th of September, I think it's the next day after the viewing, the 4th of September, I'm sitting in the bedroom, keeping out of the way, uh, because obviously at this point in time, he's drinking a lot of whiskey and he's not in a very stable state. And so I'm in the bedroom. And he gets a call and I can hear him talking and I don't know who he's talking to. But then when he ends the call, he comes through and he is basically in my face shouting at me that I shouldn't F about with him. That's what he said. I'm in control. You do as I say. Otherwise, you're out on the streets. So I'm now being threatened that he can just put me out on the streets. And this is after he said he would give us no less than 50% of the value of the property. Uh, I could have any of the furniture. He would help with the uh, removal fees. He would help with the legal fees. And now all of a sudden, it's now threatening me that I can be out on the streets. So after your ex throws this tantrum, this big power play tantrum, things do calm down a bit. And that 50-50 split that you two had talked about at one point is back on. And then you come up with this idea of wanting to keep the home in Spain for yourself. So you have an idea of how to split things so you can keep that home. And you want to talk with him about this. So you set up this meeting to discuss your idea, but things don't go well during this meeting. So what are the things that he started to say to you during this meeting? There's something that I, I don't think you quite understand. Um, you, you need to know what I want and what I need. Uh, and then he goes into how what I've proposed is a terribly, terribly, terribly bad idea and it isn't going to happen. And that's how he shuts me down in the first two minutes of that conversation. He couldn't stop himself from being angry and he couldn't stop himself from verbally abusing me and he couldn't stop himself from intimidating me and telling me that I was disrespectful. And I lacked empathy and I'm sat there and I was speechless and I could hardly string a sentence together because in my mind, how he'd spoken to us, how he'd talked to us, how he'd banged his fist on the table and started shouting and raising his voice, that was a violent 
intimidation and threatening. And in my mind, the only thing that I could think of was, oh, I'll just kill myself, should I? And that's how it went. And from that point on, I just thought, oh, what can I, what, what can I do? I felt so humiliated. I felt so small. I couldn't actually think um, straight anymore for everything that he'd promised, everything that he'd said. And then all of a sudden, I'm being accused of everything that he was, disrespectful, lacking empathy. So at this point, when it comes to your relationship, things are over. And then when it comes to, you know, splitting up these assets, right now, these things are not fully resolved yet. These these things are still in a court process. And your sense of security is really in this big, constant state of uh, flux. So, you know, you're obviously left in grief, Mm -hmm. shock, confusion, because things are being reversed on you. So how do you, I guess, go about... uh, understanding what happened is this like a moment where maybe not in this moment but later on do you eventually see that maybe your whole relationship was a lie from the moment it started because he's now in this relationship with someone he was once in a relationship with 38 years ago and the person who was the Wednesday girl was someone he was in a relationship from 2009 who we really don't know what was going on in between. You know, he says four weeks before that, but who knows? Mm-hmm. You're going to find out, you know, that he was still having a relationship with his ex-wife previous to you throughout this whole entire time as well that isn't mentioned at all by him at this time and you find that out because she does eventually call you and you find out a lot of information so it's impossible to know whatever is the truth or not the truth anymore that comes out of this person's mouth based upon their track record and how do you go through the thought process to wrap your brain around what has actually happened and the devastation of that realization when you come to that realization or conclusion. Hmm. Well, he was telling me that he'd never, he'd never loved us from the start and there was like lots of other things that he talked about. Um, and then he said that I, he was going to go to court, I would be forcibly removed, and I would leave with nothing. And that was the email I got on the 5th of October, and I just thought, oh. And basically, I blamed myself. I, 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 just, I just had this guilt, and I just thought, well, it's my fault, I've, and I blamed myself. Uh, for a long time afterwards, I just... I don't know, I just felt guilty and I just I just blamed myself for everything that had happened. Um, but from that date, on the 5th of October, was exactly the date that I remember that is when I understood that the whole of the relationship had been a lie and that I had been in a relationship and I'd been an abusive relationship. That's when I understood emotional and psychological abuse and also the other verbal abuse, the coercion, and all of that. I'd realised about grooming, even some of the sexual things that happened. And it all, after I read that email, that's when I understood. Um, I had a lot of um, trauma. I learned quite quickly. I've got to be resourceful. 
for a start. So I'll, I'm, I'm definitely someone who's resourceful. I have been all my life. I'm entrepreneurial. I have been all my life. In the personal development space that I've been in for a lot of years, I decided that, okay, I attracted this man into my life. I made mistakes. I attracted the wrong person. And then I'll, I was looking back. Yes, my childhood wasn't very good. I've been through a, a broken family home, divorce and and you know, alcoholism and all of this, what was going on. So I had an idea that I'd repeated a mistake because I've been in different relationships that weren't healthy enough. He'd repeated mistakes. He's like a serial adulterer who's been, you know, having multiple people at the same time. Uh, and. What I did, I think it took us from uh, him leaving till April of 2021. I joined a group on Facebook, which was like a grief, a grief counselling type of thing. And I started putting posts and things there. Uh, I started a YouTube channel. Uh, didn't know what the heck I was doing, but I started it anyway. And it was five minute um, affirmation videos that I was doing. Um, for gratitude and um, all different types of things that I was doing. And I was invited to write a chapter or a collaborative book. And so in April, I was just turning the corner and I, I started to do this um, writing for a collaborative book. And then I had found... Uh, a mediation company and I thought okay this is like something you know this might work we could maybe mediate and come to a solution Um, so I'd had already had about four different failed attempts at coming to some resolution between him telling us that I was going to be forcibly removed uh, I'd tried a few different things we were just about coming to a solution and it wasn't a lot of money it was like 40,000, which is like a massive drop compared to what he was offering was 115. So I'm like looking at this 40,000 is going to be the settlement. And even on that, he kept moving the goalposts. So like the mediator was telling us one thing. And then when he'd gone back to write it up and everything and do, he was wanting to deduct this or he wanted to deduct that. Mediator would come back to me and says it would be like he wants to deduct a postage stamp next. So it was, he was keep moving the goalposts. But when I was receiving an email from him, who was blamed, <laughs> I was blamed. It was always my fault. He blamed me again. I've educated myself on the emotional and psychological abuse. I've looked at the different laws. I've started up. Um, Facebook and Twitter, sort of looking at different groups and be part of them to basically understand what I've actually been through because there's a lot of women out there who go through this type of hidden emotional abuse, the hidden betrayal uh, trauma. And when it's in law, emotional and psychological abuse is actually written into the laws in the UK and it's written into the laws in Spain. But if you stand up and say it's emotional and psychological abuse, nine times out of ten you're met with a legal person who might say it's very difficult to prove emotional and psychological abuse or you go to file a complaint at the police station and it's not taken seriously. So there's lots of women out there who really don't get to see justice despite the elaborate laws that's in place well lauren i want to thank you for being here and i also just want to point out you know how could you have known that this was going on and you were dealing with someone who was playing pretend for five plus years there's a lot of betrayal uh in this and you know 
people that have gone through situations like you did, and there's a lot of shame involved, you know, you're, you'll, you're vulnerable. We had an anti-shame episode recently on why people stay, and I'll leave that link in our show notes, but you went through a lot and you were duped. And your ex played a character for more than five years. And, and you love this fake version of him. And there's no shame in that. And there's no shame in trying to figure things out for a while as you were in this huge state of confusion. So I really hope that you're easy on yourself because being betrayed like this, especially after the shock of it going on behind the scenes for so long is really devastating. Trying to decipher what's real and what's not real, the confusion of everything. It's not easy to process and, and, and go through. And today you helped a lot of people by moving through all of that with us you know, trying to tell your story and to relive this is not an easy thing to do. So I really just want to thank you for being here and sharing your story today, Lauren, because you are not alone. And there's so many people out there who are dealing with the exact same thing that you did. And you really did a good job of validating everyone through your experience today. And I really can't thank you enough uh, for being here with us today. Okay, thank you, Brandon. Well, Lauren, once again, thank you so much for being here with us today. And if you want to be a guest like Lauren was today, please do go to our website at NarcissistApocalypse.com. Top of the page, there's a button that says Guest Form. When you click on that button, it takes you to our Guest Form page. There you can read all of our instructions and either send us an email at NarcissistApocalypse at gmail.com or fill out our guest form and press the submit button. And please do send it in the format that we ask for. Also at our website, we have a support group. So if you need support, we have a support group button at the top of the page at NarcissistApocalypse.com. And when you click on that button, it takes you to our very own safe social network. There you can see that we have Zoom meetings every Wednesday night, Thursday afternoons, and Saturday nights. We also have forum boards for you to post on and for you to get the validation you need from other people in our group, fellow survivors like yourself. And you can also support fellow survivors like you there as well. So if you need support, we do have a support group at NarcissistApocalypse.com. Click on the top of the page, that support group button today and join our group. And if you need even more support, Uh, please do visit our friends at domesticshelters.org. At domesticshelters.org, they have articles and resources to help you make sense of what you are dealing with. They They have every phone number, email address, and website address for agencies and shelters, no matter how big or small your town is, domesticshelters.org has it there. And it is a wonderful free resource. It is a wonderful organization. So go to domesticshelters.org today if you need even more support. They have everything there. And that is it for today's episode. So for myself and Lauren, we hope you have a good night.